Open your Bibles to the letter of James again, chapter 5. James chapter 5. This pastoral letter of James started with the topic of trials. This is where we, with saving faith, have a distinct advantage over the world. With all the historical rises and falls of theories and attempts to help people cope with trials, we as Christians can remain steadfast. We know not only how to cope with trials as the world attempts, but how to thrive through trials. As James opened this later in chapter 1, he says, Count it all joy when you meet various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Trials can lead you to come up with the craziest of theories to try and cope. Just ask the world. Trials can lead you to try anything just to cope at all. Or you know that trials can produce steadfastness. James began this pastoral letter of pastoral care with a reminder of the knowledge that, of trials that Christians have, that the world is still miserably attempting to discover. And that is why James emphasizes steadfastness so much in the beginning of this letter, and yes, at the end of this letter, brings up the topic again. We saw that in chapter 5, verse 7 to 11, the topic of suffering with patience. But as much as we know these truths about trials, and as much as we stand categorically above all the historical and modern coping mechanisms from the world, we sometimes, maybe even oftentimes, find ourselves sinking to great levels of despair through our sufferings, especially the long-term sufferings, don't we? We know that we know better than the world, but sometimes the trials are just too much for too long. And we too resort to merely trying to cope. Or worse, we give up and just let be whatever will be. We feel that counted all joy and let steadfastness have its full effect is theologically true and profound, but the reality of our suffering sometimes speaks louder than the reality of theology, and we become completely overwhelmed by the trials of life. We feel that whereas at first we pass the suffering tests of faith with great steadfastness, we now fail every time without even putting up a spiritual fight anymore. And it gets so bad sometimes that it affects us physically. This whole metaphor of a mental illness, the metaphor of that, starts showing real symptoms. Tension, headaches, other bodily aches, fatigue, low immunity, twitches and ticks, breathing problems, unusual weight gain or weight loss, skin issues, sleeping disorders, you name it. Suffering through a trial over a long period of time takes its toil on your soul, but also on your body, doesn't it? You feel that you'll never be able to be the strong faith, joy-filled Christian that you once were. What do we do when, not just sick in general, but what do we do when our trials are so discouraging and so demotivating that your physical body starts showing signs of significant suffering? And I'm not talking about the sickness that starts some of our trials, like the discovery of having cancer or something like this. I'm talking about the sicknesses that are commonly linked to what the world would call mental illnesses or psychological disorders. Those sicknesses that are resulting sicknesses. They're not the cause of the trouble. They're what your body starts feeling because you're in trouble for so long. They're not the starting point of the trial. They're just the eventual effect of our otherwise primary suffering, whatever that might be. Yes, there's a medical side to it, but it doesn't have a medical cause. It has a psychological cause, or a mental cause, or an emotional cause, or a spiritual cause. And the doctors even admit it, right? They're willing to alleviate the symptoms, but they affirm that the cause isn't really medical. 
You have the long-term anxiety over your finances, the intense emotional strain after some trauma, the personal conflict in a long-term relationship, the routine struggles that consume our daily activities. Those are the real causes for these kind of sicknesses. As some doctors will say, the cause is stress. Okay, they didn't discover that by a blood test. They just figured it out by looking at you. <laughs> okay, the cause is stress. The solution is take a break, not take a pill. If that describes you as long-term suffering that perhaps is starting to show physical side effects even, if that describes you, then you are the one that our next passage in James is for. James 5, verse 7 to 11 was a strengthening of our soul to suffer with patience. But verses 13 and 14 indicate at least three possible responses to that passage. Okay, we're following up on that. Some of us are suffering, and we know it, and we want to do what is right, and we want the Lord to show us compassion and kindness, and so we pray. Verse 13, after all this suffering with patience, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. That's the first response, the endurance that just keeps praying. Another response to verses 7 to 11 is the reinfusion of so much spiritual strength through those verses that the steadfastness factor features so significantly in your minds that we truly, as chapter 1 says, count it all joy when we're suffering. And so we sing in response to trials, verse 13b. Is anyone cheerful after reading this passage? Let him sing praise. That's like the apostles in prison, right? Suffering, but the steadfastness factor is so prominent in their minds that they're, they just am, am impelled to sing. But then there's a third kind of response. It is the one who, having heard the steadfastness perspective of chapter 1, and having considered the suffering and patience perspective of 5, verse 7 to 11, still feels overwhelmed. In fact, it seems to be getting worse. It is not that you are necessarily sinning in some great way. You're just overwhelmed. You believe the Scriptures and you know better, but it is just too much. And on top of it all, your body is even showing symptoms of sickness not previously there. Today's verses are for this third group coming through all the passages of suffering in this book and still feeling overwhelmed. And all the significant trials of life that really weigh us down, there is always some compassionate pastoral verse straight from God's heart through the care of the saints to your soul. And that verse is what we get to today. So let's read the verses before us. They're very controversial. And then we'll see what they actually mean. Verse 14, 15, and 16 of James chapter 5. James 5 verse 14, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. There are many theories and explanations about what these verses are all about. This is why we wish that we were the original audience and not those 2,000 years later who need to work really hard to ascertain exactly what this refers to. These verses have caused a fair amount of confusion in different churches. You were perhaps part of that confusion at the time even. It has caused a fair amount of rather bizarre practices in some versions of Christianity. But remember this, before we get to it, remember, this is not just some clinical study for us this morning of some ancient customs and Greek phrases. This is meant from God for you and me when overwhelmed by the trials of life, with our bodies joining the protest, to be helped. This is the, the more advanced course in handling trials. 
There are a number of commandments here. It is, it's almost like a manual for when things get particularly tough. Do this, do this, do this. Super helpful, exactly what we want. You just tell me what to do. This is about how to get help when your trial is weighing you down spiritually and eventually even physically. Let me repeat that because that's what these passages are about. It's, it's about how to get help when your trial is weighing you down spiritually and even physically. This is not your first class grade one on Christian suffering. This is the advanced class. The first class was in chapter one, right? Count it all joy. There's great steadfastness that's to be had. It focused on the purpose of trials and the blessing of steadfastness. The next class in suffering, the significant class at least, it's kind of scattered throughout this letter, but the next significant class was here in chapter 5, verse 7 to 11. It added to everything said in chapter 1, just like grade 2 adds to everything you learned in grade 1. But now we speed up to matric very quickly. This is advanced. This is for when the trial is advanced. Its effect on you is much worse than it was before. For whatever reason, this is more difficult. And that's what this verse is here to address. So I'm not just going to discuss all the different views and practices that I think wrongfully has come out of this verse. I'm going to walk through it and explain it. Explain every phrase, and it better all make sense. And if it doesn't, tell me afterwards, because then we have to change our view. The first way, then, to get help when your trial is weighing you down spiritually and even physically is to call your elders to join you in prayer. I promise we'll get to the oil phrase, but that's not a primary focus here. It's a secondary focus, so we'll keep it secondary for later. Call your elders to join you in prayer. You are suffering, as verse 13 says, you need to pray then. But when your suffering is starting to cause its own set of physical symptoms, then add your elders to the prayers of verse 13. Okay, normal suffering, go pray. God will, will answer you. We even sang about it. He will hold you fast. <laughs> But when sickness gets added as a consequence of your suffering, then add the elders to your prayers. Verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? So is anyone suffering? Is anyone cheerful? Is anyone sick? He's still asking the same questions based on this intense suffering of earlier. If anyone is suffering and then also anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, there are many reasons to specifically ask the elders of your church and not just one another to join you in prayer. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, the issue is a little more severe. It's actually a sin issue, not just a suffering issue. But there too, it says, you who are spiritual should go and help the person and restore him. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 and following, in the context of suffering again, it is the elders who are exhorted to go and shepherd the sheep. And their suffering. And the saints are exhorted there to humbly accept the shepherding care of the elders. In fact, turn to First Peter, it's just a page or two over towards the end of your Bible. First Peter chapter five. I think it's a very significant parallel to the passage here in James, and I want you to see it with your own eyes. Like the letter by James, this letter by Peter is written to Christians scattered. He says that in the first verse. And they are also experiencing significant suffering. Yes, even persecution in Peter's case. Every time, in fact, you read 1 Peter, it's like Jeremiah. You just think suffering. 1 Peter 5, verse 1 to 5 is the passage I just mentioned. Let's continue in the passage, though, starting from the second line in verse 5. 1 Peter 5, verse 5, they're halfway in. It says, "'Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another.'" For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering 
are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Okay, walking through these verses, you've, you've gained God's trials that are rather advanced. You are really struggling. Then be humble enough to ask for help. God will definitely raise you up again, so pray. Cast your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Don't let your physical body bear the burden of so many great worries. God is omnipotent, mighty God. He'll bear them, and He'll answer every single of your anxious prayers. Stay alert so you don't give in to all the sinful temptations of the trial. And know that you are never the only one. But many Christians are suffering with these more advanced kind of trials too. In fact, let them help you. Your elders are not mature by accident, to link it to the first five verses. They have suffered too. Call them. Call them just to pray with you. Call them just to know about your trial. Call them to encourage and strengthen you. Call them to be that human instrument of God's almighty full restoration of you. Back in James 5, if your body is cluing you into the fact that your trial has reached an advanced stage, then call your elders. If you haven't before, call them. Call them simply with these words. If you don't know what to say, write down these words. Say, hi, I'm struggling. Will you come pray with me? Click. (laughs) Hey, it might even just be a voice note to your elders saying things aren't going as well as they appeared on Sunday. Please, will you come pray with me? The elders will do the follow-up, okay? You You just have to call them. They will do the follow-up with a call or a visit simply to hear you out and to pray. Come, listen, pray, leave. Okay, we're not going to stay for coffee. We'll just come quickly. Call your elders so that they can know that this is a worse than usual kind of trial. Now, you might never have done this because you're very fearful of this little oil ritual in this verse. So let me explain what that was and what the parallel to our time might be. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? sick as a result of all the suffering. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. This is not a medical reference. Oil was used medicinally at the time, but more for injuries and wounds, not really for sickness. To anoint with oil is to pour oil over somebody's head, anoint, not to pour it into a wound. To anoint with oil in Scripture was either a ceremonial thing or a hospitality thing. Can you understand the ceremonial thing? Ceremonial, it was sometimes part of the gift of healing. It was a miraculous gift of healing, but still they used oil. You're like, why? It's a miracle. <laughs> you didn't need oil. Well, the physical pouring of the oil or the laying on the, of the hands or something like that was the physical thing the person with the gift of healing did to link the healing to that person. So you couldn't just say, well, I just randomly was healed for some reason. No, no, there was a person there with a gift of healing, Jesus or the apostles or somebody like that. You remember in Mark chapter 6 when Jesus sent out the 12 on a mission trip, it says, they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Okay, the common gift of healing in the New Testament. The healing was miraculous. Therefore, the oil was a ceremonial act linking the healing activity to the man with the gift of healing. They were acting on behalf of Christ, so it could certainly be, as James says, in the name of the Lord. And this might perhaps be what James has in mind. And certainly many churches have practiced something like this, the elders coming, anointing with oil, expecting miraculous healing. But most of the time, there is no miraculous healing. So it can't be the gift of healing, because it always works. So I'm not convinced that this is what James had in mind. 
It is possible, I guess, but I think there's a more natural understanding of what James is saying here. Remember, all of James has been fairly simple vocabulary, simple sayings. This was very easily understood at the time. This anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord is more naturally simply a reference to the daily blessing that the Lord gives to those who remain righteous. The daily earthly blessing. Even We're not talking about steadfastness here. We're talking about earthly stuff. I believe this is a, daily, a reference to the daily, simple, daily blessing that God gives those who remain righteous. Anointing your head with oil and even the heads of those whom you invite for dinner with oil was a custom of the day that demonstrated your care for yourself and others. It was in the context of personal grooming or hospitality. It's like your daily grooming routine the offering of your bathroom to your guests to go wash their hands or something like that, to refresh themselves after a long day before sitting down to eat. Except here, it's not just a mere courtesy. It's a statement of fellowship and care. It's got a spiritual component in the name of the Lord. I think it's an expression of God's blessing that will always remain with you in the small little details of daily life, daily care, even through the greatest trial. Psalm 23 was read earlier. You know verse 5 and 6. God, you, and all these blessings on earth, right? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow follow me all the days of my life. The psalmist is saying there, Lord, you bring me at a place where my daily experience is that of refreshment and growth and maturity, even in the physical thing of anointing my head with oil. It's like, God, you, you comb my hair and brush my teeth and get me dressed in the morning. So also, Psalm 92, verse 10, you have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. And then it continues with an affirmation in Psalm 92 of seeing his enemies destroyed and seeing the righteous flourish under trial. We can throw a verse from Ecclesiastes into the mix too. In Ecclesiastes 9, there's this little paragraph of optimism, this positive interlude to all the expressions of futility and meaningless of earthly life. There are a couple of loose parallels between James 5 and Ecclesiastes 9. Besides the general context of Ecclesiastes, which is suffering and futility and everything is meaningless, chapter 9, verse 2 says, even it goes so far to say, it doesn't even matter if you're righteous or wicked, good or evil, clean or unclean, religious or not, because everybody dies. It adds even as James 5, verse 12 did, it doesn't matter if you make oaths and keep them or shun making oaths in your life, you still die. But then listen to this little positive interlude. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 7 to 10. In all the futility of life, go, eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. How's that for an encouraging verse, eh? Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun. Because that, living with your wife joyfully, is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. He just spent eight chapters saying it's futile to do it. Here he says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in the realm of the dead to which you are going. You still feel the depressing undertones of this book. He says, go, eat, drink, get clean clothes, anoint your head with oil, enjoy life with your wife. Excel at what you do. In summary, then, in this Ecclesiastes passage, when you sense life's futility, and you sense it intensely, and when you feel like being righteous is no better than doing whatever the world does, then go, 
get something nice to eat, get something refreshing to drink, knowing that God already approves what you're doing as a Christian. Go, put on clean clothes, groom and refresh yourself, brush your teeth, comb your hair. Let not oil be lacking on your head, as they would say. Find pleasure and enjoyment in your marriage. Isn't your spouse often the one that first feels the brunt of your depression? Turn it around. Make your spouse the joyful ingredient to help you endure the trial. And then go do whatever is next on your agenda. Go do it to the best of your ability. Now that's some excellent practical counsel for more advanced trials. Eat, drink, take care of yourself. What did God do with Elijah and his depression? He fed him first. Eat, drink, take care of yourself. If married, use it as a frequent excuse for a time out from life's trials. Excel in whatever you have to do next, knowing that God has already put a stamp of approval on your faith-filled life year in the sin-cursed world. What is striking about these Old Testament references to being anointed with oil is that they are all in a context where enemies abound and where life feels futile. Just like James chapter 5. So don't fear when you call the elders that the elders are going to perform this little oil ritual on you. Rather expect that their coming to you to pray with you will be accompanied with some relief from the trials and some practical motivation just to get yourself up in the morning again. Remember what Proverbs 24 verse 16 says? It says the righteous fall seven times and get up and rise again. For the elders to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, is to pray for you in your more advanced trials and to refresh yourself practically again, but spiritually as well, in the name of the Lord. Just like wiping your face, brushing your teeth, combing your hair, getting dressed in nice clothes every morning has a bit of a refreshing and motivating effect on your body. So the elders coming to pray for you is like spiritual refreshment, motivating your soul to endure where your body feels like giving up. It's inevitable that the elders who come will not only pray, but will come with words of encouragement, with some practical instructions just to stay focused and stay strong as long as the trial lasts. They will pray, and to put the anointing of oil in terms of the customs of our day, they will combine it with spiritual in the name of the Lord component. They will remind you of the blessing from God that comes to the righteous through daily personal care and refreshment. When in your great trial you wake up and it's just a beautiful day out there, look at it and say, this is a tiny little bit of daily physical refreshment that God is giving me to prove that He always takes care of the righteous. Well, you might think it's unspiritual, it's just a sunrise or whatever. <laughs> it's just a good cup of coffee in the morning. No, that's God showing you approves what you do. Accept the elders humbly, as First Peter 5 said, and the Lord will raise you up again, is the promise. In fact, that's what verse 15 in James 5 says. All tied to us as those who are struggling with the more advanced trials of life, who are even being affected by it in their bodies. Verse 15 says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. The saving here, by the way, is not spiritual saving, it's deliverance from the sickness, as it says, save the one who is sick. Also, the raising up here is not about future resurrection. It is simply the morning exercise of getting up. And as Ecclesiastes 9 says, doing with your might whatever you need to still do. In other words, verse 15 is, is promising healing of the sickness that comes from this overstressed heart. And a bit of physical restoration to daily excellence. You see that daily excellence, excellence with Elijah too in his depression, right? Gets food and drink first. Then he has the spiritual refreshment from the Lord. And the Lord says, well, get back to your job. 
Okay, let me give you three things to go do just to get you back again. The physical health benefits of a steady heart is no secret. Even the world has figured that out. A joyful heart won't cure your cancer, but it will cure all the sicknesses that came as a result of the burden of your cancer. Proverbs 17, 22, a joyful heart is good medicine. Or listen to this very relevant verse from Proverbs 27, verse 9. It says, oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Combining the spiritual input with just the physical niceness of oil and perfume. Like daily care of your body has a good effect on your heart attitude, so the earnest counsel of a good friend is good for your heart. And the encouraged heart is God's cure for a number of physical maladies. Are you suffering? Make it a matter of prayer. Are you suffering so much that you're becoming physically sick over the stress and anxiety of it all? then call the elders to come and join you in prayer. Call them to come and restore you to your normal daily activities that are still needing to be done. The trial might well continue, but because the heart is restored to faith again, the body can recover at least from the trial-induced ailments. With a renewed heart and a strengthened body, you can get back to the less advanced, more normal handling of the difficult realities of life on this planet. The first way to get help when your trial is weighing you down spiritually and maybe even physically is call the elders of the church to join you in prayer to build you up again. That's God's way of healing you. The second way then to get help when your trial is weighing you down spiritually and even physically is to call one another to help you with any sin. Okay, this one's a bit different. Call one another to help you with any sin. You could almost say like this is the advanced, advanced class. It's even further advanced than just suffering through a trial. The context is still suffering with patience through the trials of life. The context is still the one who is struggling to remain strong in the faith. But added to the struggle is the entry of not just weak responses to trials like we've dealt with up to now, but sinful responses to life. They are also coming in now. You know what it's like, right? It's nothing new to us. Your trial is not necessarily the consequence of a sin like Job's friends would sometimes make you believe. But, to be honest, you feel like sin is starting to creep in a little too often now. What was previously just a weak faith and the promised steadfastness that will come is now overt sin. Grumbling, arguing, resentfulness perhaps. Or maybe anger, selfishness in the form of self-pity. Or blame shifting as though everybody else is to blame for all your troubles. This is not just the slow neglect of daily responsibilities, but it is also the resentfulness against others for not helping the way you expected them to help. This is not just a weak response to ongoing trials. This is a sinful response to those trials. The sin isn't necessarily part of your suffering as though you sin and therefore you're suffering. Not at all. You're just suffering because of life. But sadly, sin is becoming part of your responses to that suffering. And we all know that this slippery slope makes everything a million times worse. How do you, when suffering through something intensely for a long time, how do you, when increasingly struggling to respond with a strong faith, how do you, when your pride and self-pity overtake you, how do you get yourself right again? It's not just a sin you committed. It's a sin on the back of a long time of suffering and trials and difficulty and depression and anxiety. 
How do you ever come back to the beginning again? Well, back to verse 14. If anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church. Call your elders. You need help. Let them pray. And if, if in the possible occasion of sin being a part of your responses, then, well, the prayers and comforts and counsel of the elders will be the solution to that sinfulness to you. If, if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. And if. In severe suffering amongst one another, we never do as Job's friends did and say, you must have sinned, that's why you're suffering. That's completely unbiblical. It's a pagan concept, even if it's common in Christianity. Sin has its consequences that often cause much of the suffering in this life, but that's not what this passage is about. This passage has always been the sufferings that just come because you're in this life. The normal trials of an earthly existence. But just because sin wasn't part of the start of your suffering doesn't mean that your responses to the sufferings are necessarily sinless. So if suffering, pray, pray strong in the faith. If suffering and increasingly weak in your faith to the point where your health is also bearing the burden of the suffering, then call the elders to join you in prayer, refreshing you again in the Lord, and you will be healed. And if in all that, if also you have been sinning in your responses, then know that those sins will be forgiven. This is not a blame game to analyze your suffering. This is your weak faith asking for help, healing, and forgiveness. This is your weak faith struggling, pleading for full restoration. This is faith, perhaps weak, but nonetheless, faith affirming that trials can be endured, that the elders of the church are great partners in suffering, and that God can forgive all the sins you've succumbed to. This is not a blame game. Don't ever use it as such. Just because the next verse says, confess your sins, doesn't mean you start there. You start with the way the verse starts. If you have sinned, know you'll be forgiven. It's not a blame game. It's a forgiveness promise. Therefore, because of the promise that your sins will be forgiven, you lift up your head, you acknowledge your sinful responses, as the next verse says, you confess them to one another, you are helped through the pitting off of them and the pitting on of righteousness, and you are yielded. Just like the prayer of faith from the elders bearing the burden with you eventually restores you to full health, so if there has been sin, the freedom of guilt that comes from forgiveness lightens your heart, restores to you the joy of your salvation, and thereby again, as verse 15 said, you are healed from those ailments that resulted from your overburdened soul. Let me give you an example of all this. Let's pick the trial of financial difficulty, one that's rather common in the last 18 months. Financial difficulty, this is not due to any sin or foolishness from your side. It's simply the effects of living in an unpredictable, trial-filled life. Perhaps your finances are strained because of medical bills, be, perhaps because of accidents or some other misfortunes, perhaps because of a loss of income for... Looting reasons. Being a Christian with true saving faith, you make it through chapter 1, and you consider it true joy because you're learning steadfastness before God in ways you've never considered before. But after a year or two years or five years or 20 years of financial difficulty, it really starts wearing you down. You've applied for jobs, you've started little side businesses, but eventually everything still comes to nothing. You get to chapter 5 or 7 to 11 and your faith is again strengthened to suffer with patience, trusting that your daily faithfulness in all things keeps you rich in the faith even if poor in life. 
But with increasing costs across the economy, your financial trial starts gnawing at your soul again. And you start developing severe headaches, sleeplessness, and anxiety. At first, you think it's just a physical illness, and you go and see your doctor. But because there's no virus causing the problem, as much as the distress and worry, the doctor tells you, I can give you this, but um, you're just stressed. The physiotherapist helps you perhaps with some neck and shoulder exercises with the headaches, but you know they're only treating the symptoms, not the cause. You know it all started just because the trial has gone on for too long. That puts you in verses 14 and 15. But then, then you start sinning in your responses. First, just in your heart, doubting God's goodness, grumbling in your heart perhaps against those family members who expect so much from you but do so little to help. You bottle it all up within you, knowing that you're becoming very selfish in your expectations, but justifying it by the great pity that you've developed for yourself and what you have to live with. Then, as sin always does, it comes out in snide little remarks or maybe an overt arguing and fighting. You want the problems to disappear, but they don't. And your sin increasingly obscures God out of the picture, placing you on the pedestal of all your desires. Sounds a bit like the rest of James, doesn't it? You worry instead of pray. You grumble over what is lacking instead of thanking those who are still lovingly taking care of you and being alongside you. You withdraw from the responsibilities of daily chores, family commitments, church one another, commandments, whatever it might be. You suppress your conscience with self-indulgence, be it an avalanche of thoughts about yourself or an escape to entertainment. You even toy with escapes promised by various addictions, legal or illegal. Do you see the trajectory? The particular details of the trial or the expressions of sin might be very different for each of us, but the trajectory is always the same. Trial comes, faith responds well. Trial remains, faith gets weak. Trial still remains, sin is entertained and justified by a hundred different excuses. That's the trajectory. It's always the same. How do you interrupt that trajectory? How do you ever get back? Well, you pray, it says. You're like, yes, but I do pray, and it doesn't work. It just seems to be getting worse. Well, the trial might well be getting worse, but it seems like your faith is getting worse too. Then you call the elders of the church to pray is the next instruction, to pray with you and bear you up before the Lord. You get help from those who have learned to be steadfast. You get help from them. And they're able to bear your burden alongside you, continually refreshing your faith in the Lord. Like, so, like David in Psalm 32, you stop covering your sinful responses and instead you uncover them through confession and God forgives. As Psalm 32 continues, it says, You again have joy over salvation. You're again committed to godliness. You see James 5 work out in one psalm in Psalm 32. It's absolute depression. It's affecting his body. Even he says, My vitality is dried up. I confess my sins to you and you forgave. And he's got joy of salvation at the end of it again. He's even evangelizing others at the end of it all. God, therefore, heals the sickness that came because of all the suffering. He does all the healing and restoration so that you can one day or the next day again stand up, face the trial every single day back in square one with a faith strong in the Lord. Joy attaining the steadfastness that was promised. Why is this such a sheer solution to the otherwise really bad trajectory? Why does this actually work? Well, verse 16. It said, therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. We looked at that. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. That's why this works every time. It's not because the medicine has the right ingredients in. It's because of the righteous who were praying and God answers the prayers. 
Note that this person isn't the one who knows what is, it is like or the one who has been through it himself before. Okay, there's some great comfort that can be had from people like that, but not always. One of our sinful responses to trials is often to dismiss every form of help, no matter how qualified on human terms. We do not need mere empathy. We need righteous objectivity. We need someone who is strong in the faith to help us when we're weak in the faith. We need somebody with clarity about sin and righteousness to pray for us when we are overcome and entrenched in sinful responses to suffering. We might not feel that God is hearing our prayers, but at least we know God listens to the righteous. And and those who are themselves steadfast and sure in the faith, we know God listens to them, right? Well, God listens to you too, but you're not believing that anymore. But surely He's listening to the righteous in your faith still. Such prayers are indeed heard, and God affirms for us here that such prayers have their prayed for outcome. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Whether or not the original trial remains, you can be sure of forgiven sins. Your sins are not continuing the trajectory. They can be forgiven and you be placed back in square one. And you can be sure also of being healed from all those suffering-induced ailments. You can be fully assured of being raised up by the Lord day by day, every morning again, to do what your hand finds to do because of the righteous elders' prayers of a mature faith. Now, we can't look at the rest of the passage here in James today. Our time is going to not allow us to do so. But that's what the very next set of verses are all about. Verses 17 and 18, there's an ordinary but righteous man who prayed for an entire nation's trials and sins, and God answered their prayer and forgave their sin and ended their suffering. It happened. Then verses 19 and 20 focuses back on the one another's, the church, and we are reminded of the profound significance of being able to come alongside each other when wandering from the faith and sinning and being restored to one another again. You see, this closing section of the book of James is an extraordinary section. It is the more advanced help for the more advanced kind of suffering. But it isn't anything strange or mystical or ritualistic or anything like that. It's just really normal saving faith and action on a one another level. Let us not become weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. But if any of us do lose heart and are caught in any transgression, call those who are spiritual and let them restore you, bearing your burden with you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this is truly reason to pray. Lord, what assurance is given us in these verses, assurance of being able actually to thrive in even the more severe kind of trials. Encouragement and a promise here that our sins that certainly weigh us down more and and we become resistant to confessing it because we know it's bad and, and still we're so overwhelmed by it all, the assurance here that you'll forgive. Oh Lord, help us with this. Help us not to be these lone Christians who put up a fake smile through the severe trials and act as though everything is okay, but in the meantime we're completely falling apart May we use the tools you have given us to reverse everything, even if the trial remains, to reverse at least where we're at in it all. Lord, thank you for the times in which we have experienced things like this. And it is through the one and others that you have restored us, healed us physically of these kind of sicknesses that come because of stress and worry and anxiety. 
Lord, thank you that we as Christians do not need to act as though this life is just temporary and one day heaven will fix all the problems. But even now already, in this temporariness, when it feels like it's an eternity of trials, we can know that you've given us help. Thank you for this passage, Lord. Open our hearts to understand it and value it and practice it. And Lord, may we come alongside one another, bearing each other's burdens and so fulfilling the law of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.